Okay. Let's see where we are on the old schedule. Yes. Ah. Uh, here we go. Schedule, we're almost done. Look at this. I only have four lectures left, really, because we have exam time or exam review. Today we are here? Yes. So, uh, we'll save MRI materials, interesting things, for when we actually have talked about some modern stuff. So we didn't get to Faraday's Law last time, but we are going to go through it today. And who knows, we might finish it, we might need some of this time. But we're more or less back on schedule. The main thing you need to know about the magnetic field from 29 is uh, what we talked about and what's on the homework due Monday. That's right, so how you make a magnetic field from a current. And uh, a straight wire, a loop of wire, or a uh, solenoid. And then the forces magnetic fields create on wires and charges and the torques they create on loops. As you'll see, that's pretty much the whole homework. Okay? So if you go through that, you'll have everything covered. I think these sections are accurate. I'll double check if any need to be removed. But I think it's one, two, three, four, seven, eight, nine, and 10. Well, obviously not 10, yeah, because we're saying 10. Okay? Basically, one, two, three, four, seven, eight, nine. Now, we're going in to do Faraday's Law, we're going into 30. Okay, so 30, basically 1 through 5. So all we're looking at is chapter 30, section 1 through 5. Today, maybe half of Wednesday. So there'll be a little homework on uh, today's topic, induction, and then some sort of homework on all the modern stuff. And then we've covered everything, and it can all be on the exam. The new plan is working out so well. Okay, so that's where we are, more or less. No flaws, that's great. Um, let's see. Today, let's see, we're working on that. I knew Sarah would beat me in that. I knew I had no chance. Um, <coughs> so there's something else to tell you. Oh, yeah, I forgot what to tell you, but I learned about myself at your book. I learned that these things are amazing. Like, how can you not wear these? They're so useful. Like, anything you need. So I decided I can't quite take the reputational kid of wearing it in my everyday life, but they're perfect for lecture. Check this out. <laughs> I will always lecture with these now. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so today we start with thinking about who's the greatest scientist that's ever lived. Okay, you guys, are just you might have named one famous scientist at all. Maybe just one, but you went with maybe you kept it personal. Maybe I'm maybe you thought I said on campus, I'm not sure. But anyway. Anybody have any uh, historical guesses on the famous scientist that ever lived? Sarah, who's the, famous, who's the greatest scientist that's ever lived in the history of the universe? Did I already go through this? Then you should know it's Faraday. I guess we already talked about this. I lost track of time. Faraday, greatest scientist that's ever lived. And today we're going to talk about this a lot. Did I tell you the whole story of Faraday, rags and riches? Let's assume I did. I don't know. He was a janitor of the Royal Society. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I already told you. So today we're going to talk about his law. Did I tell you that he didn't know any math? He could only do algebra? I don't remember. Yeah, I was paying attention to it. We're going to talk about his law today. Faraday's law. Okay. Of electromagnetic induction. And we're going to have to do a little bit of vector calculus today. You know how I talk about it. You don't really need to know the calculus. You're just going to be able to visualize the calculus. Today, that's, that's what we're doing today. All right? All right. And I got an email yesterday that said, hey, I heard there's no calculus in 126. And I said, well, let's see about that today. So you can blame that person that emailed me and said that for today's lecture. A changing uh, magnetic flux. And that's the thing we've got to talk about what it means. The changing magnetic flux through a loop induces uh, and EMF around them. So remember, EMF is kind of was the thing that a battery does to give some charge carriers energy to make them move. And uh, we're going to talk about another way you can get an EMF. So let's look at the uh, geometry of this. First, let's imagine maybe you've got you know, a uniform. Uh, let's draw a loop first. Uh, yeah, let's draw a loop. Let's imagine you got a loop. Right, sort of sitting in the plane of the board, or you know, perpendicular to the board, sort of a 3D drawing for you there. And let's imagine it's in a uniform magnetic field. This is the loop, by the way, not going to label it. There's the field, and here uh, it's going through the loop. Right? There's some R and street for you there. There you go. 
a, uh, a loop and a V loop, like that, okay? So now let's write Faraday's law in equation form. The EMF that's generated around that loop is equal to minus N V big phi V dt. There it is. So now we just got to talk about what all those things mean. Alright? So this is the EMF or the voltage around the loop. Alright? The voltage around, what is the voltage around the loop? Well, it's not clear. Okay? We get into that, we'll get into the mind blowing universe changing things. So let's just accept that there's a voltage around the loop for now. Okay? If is the number of loops. And for most things I'm going to do today, it's going to be one. If you put two loops, you get twice as much EMF. Ugh. Let's just do one loop for now, just keep that simple. Okay, here's the big one. What in the heck is the phi V? That's the magnetic flux. Flux is an old timey word that is about vector theory. Okay? So the symbol for the magnetic flux is just the phi V part. So we're talking about the time derivative of phi v. And the EMF you get is the negative time derivative of whatever the magnetic flux is. Okay. So first let me give you a formula for the magnetic flux, and then we'll talk about physically what it means. Here we go. Integral. The person that emailed me yesterday, there's no calculus in 126. Why can't I take an algebra-based course and get credit for it? Well, here you go. Take a picture, Snapchat that. Calculus-based course. Snap this. Uh, I'm hoping he's not in here. I think uh, he was one of the, yeah, he won't be in here. No, it's fine, he's in here. Um, it's the integral of b dot dA. What does that mean? That means basically everywhere you go, you divide this little thing into little areas of dA. Or if it's just a nice flat area, you just call it A. Or if it's a complicated surface, you gotta handle it, you gotta tile it into little dA's and sum them up. That's why it's difficult vector calculus. However, if your A is sort of just, just a flat surface, you can just say A, then you could just say it's B not into A, if B is constant over A. Okay. So if we would do a bunch of vector calculus, we would make spheres and semicircles and curved surfaces and vectors going different ways. This is all 102 stuff. We do like at a very simple level, we do it 102. Here, let's just do this. Let's not do the actual calculus. Let's just say it's B dot into A. And you have to assume B is constant over the loop, and then there's just one A. It's not like a curve of the loop. Is everybody okay with that? We could go deep into the vector calculus for the last two weeks. Did it last year, they, oh my god. It's like, it's not gonna be on the exam. Why are you mad? <laughs> oh, okay. Okay, so let's look at this B dot A. Okay, now, what does that mean? That means that we'll get an EMF if B dot A changes in time. So why would it change in time? We have a loop sitting in a uniform field, nothing's happening. So here, the EMF is zero. That's all it is. The flux that we're talking about, V dot A, it's a way to keep up. It's kind of like how much field is going through a, a loop. Okay, so my best analogy is this. So if the field is like the wind, okay? So here's wind. This is gonna blow, and the field is the velocity field of the air. All right, so here's wind. Those are little field lines, by the way, you can't tell. Right, so I have some wind here. I have a field, like a uniform field pointing this way, right in front of the fan. Okay, and now here's the loop. Okay, is there wind going through the loop? Yes, there's air going through the loop. That's a big flux. What is the flux now? Zero. There's no wind going through the loop now, is there? The wind is like this here also. It'll be more clear. Turn it on. Yes. See, that makes it more clear. Okay. So now the flux is bigger because I made the V field bigger. We have more wind. But if I turn it this way, zero. What if I turn it this way? Zero. All right. So that's why it's a dot product. The V field is the wind this way. The area, you know, is perpendicular to the surface. The surface is the middle of right? So V dot dA or V dot A is maximum when it's like this, when V and A are parallel. But it's zero when they're like this. Okay? So you can think of the flux is how much field is blowing through the loop. Okay. That is how you think about field.
fields and fluxes. And let me show you what I did for my kids like eight hours a day that kept them happy when they were little. Uh, it's coming back. Oh, I used to be good at it. Never mind. Um, wah, 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 wah. <laughs> Q, V, B equals Q, E. And 
We did that without a bunch of vector stuff because everything is perpendicular and parallel here. Right? So V is perpendicular to V is perpendicular to the motion. So we're not to get into V problem. These are obviously it is definitely in the same direction. The Q V cross B is up and down, the electric field is up and down. So let's just get the magnitude Q full. And then you just cancel the Q. So they're gonna move until, or with a certain they're going to move to create an electric field, V times B. Remember, the velocity isn't the velocity of how fast they move. The velocity was this way. So you can basically select the electric field by how fast you move the thing in the magnetic field. The E inside is equal to how fast you move it, how big the magnetic field is. Basically, how fast you move it, how big the magnetic field is, the more charge is moved to the poles, therefore the bigger the electric field is. So that's just sort of some fields cares about that. What we could do, though, is think about um, the potential difference. That's what people care about. What is the potential difference between the top and the uh, bottom? And for that, you want to remember, in a case like this, where it's kind of like the field between parallel plates, that delta V is E times the length of the, of the cylinder. And if you want to write it that way, you can also say, Delta V, which is kind of like the EMF, is the electric field inside times L. Okay. So then you can just plug in this thing, and you get that delta V, which is kind of like the EMF across um, a cylinder, right? the voltage across a cylinder, it's not a loop yet, but there's a voltage there, is uh, VLV. Let's write it in that word. So we got something kind of like Faraday's Law. Yeah, not really, though. Let's see. Do we have any loops? No. Do we have a voltage around a loop? No, we don't have a loop. Did the magnet, is there any magnetic flux? We can't even talk about magnetic flux. We don't have a loop yet. Okay. So this isn't really Faraday's Law. This is just getting you ready to think about Faraday's Law. Thinking about the field. Here's a question. How are the electric field and magnetic field in the same direction since B is into the page the electric field is on the plane. Oh, they're not the same direction. Uh, I'm saying these two forces are in the same direction. So I didn't bother to do, go through all the direction part. Right? But the B field is this way. The force was this way. Therefore, the positive goes this way. The negative goes that way. So it makes an electric field along this line. But the force is in the opposite direction. This is a magnetic force. And the electric force would also be along the cylinder like that. OK, so it's not quite fair to this volume. So let's do something else, okay? We're missing a loop. So let's make this thing a loop and see if that gives us very long. Okay. Square loop in uniform B. Oh, I turned it. Okay, let's go through it real quick. Which way 
the positive charge build up? So uh, why do the charges move like that in the magnetic field? Positive up, negative down. Yeah, we're about to show you again. If you didn't get it here, you're going to get it here. Here we go. The force is Q, V, cross, V. Okay? A little positive test charge sitting, say, here. Free to move. If only someone would push on it. Okay? It's moving down with the wire. That's what you didn't see. This little positive test charge is moving down because the whole thing is moving down. So this little free charge is being forced to move down by the loop. So what's, what's the force on this little charge? B cross B. Oh, of course it's this one. Now, B. What about a little negative one down here? Oh, it's also being forced to move down B cross B. Oh, this way, but it's negative. Force of B is that way. So your positive charge is built up on this side, and your negative charge is built up on that side. What about the one sitting here? Oh, it feels the force this way. Oh, there's nowhere to go. So why? Maybe the right side of the wire gets a little more positive than the left side. Okay. So which side of you relates positive charge? Side four. If you don't see it, save that in your notes for when you're studying later. It's side four. Right? Okay. So now, is this, are we going to get, uh, are we going to get, is this Faraday's law? Where are we doing Faraday's law? Oh, we have a loop. Check. Okay. We have magnetic flux, don't we? If the magnetic field is the wind, and this is a loop, I have wind going through the loop. Magnetic flux. Check. Uh, do we have an EMF, though? Uh, no. That's why I didn't call this an EMF before. An EMF is like a potential around the loop. This just got polarized with some delta V. This is polarized with a delta V. You got delta V from this side to that side. But there's no EMF. Okay. So the EMF, no. Why? Because D phi B D T is zero. If this field is uniform, then here you have a flux of the V field going through, a certain amount of wind blowing through. But if I move this this way, it's the same amount of wind blowing through. Right? There's nothing changing there. So there's no reason. So Faraday's law would say no EMF. And our little physical model here of how free charges move also no EMF. It just becomes polarized. Man, what's it going to take to get a EMF? Here we go. Okay. Well, that's going to be about this way. Again, a square loop exits a uniform field. B at speed B. Okay, 
Out of a little loop, a little guy here, a little positive test charge right here. What do I feel? Oh, I don't want to be there. I feel a little test charge right here. Okay, so V is that way. Remember the little test charge, all the all the sorry, test charge, all the free charges are moving with the whole loop. They're confined to the loop. It's gotta be that way. Be that way, it feels a force up. Okay? What if I'm negative? I feel a force down. FB pulling it down. And before, this only polarized because over here you have forces pushing them the same way, but not anymore. There's no field here. B is zero. Okay? So nothing is pushing these up. So this goes around here, and this goes around here, and we get a current. Because those are opposite charges. They're both current flow in the same direction. Okay, so we see. So net current is created due, I'll just say due to F B only on one side. Is sort of the simple physical way to think about it. Before we're generating little delta Bs on both sides, and they can basically cancel. Here, it's almost like a battery. We're taking the charges and creating a little delta V just right here, which can cause current flow. Exactly like what a battery does. That's what we call it an EMF. That's the historical word for what a battery does. So they use that word for what um, induction does. Okay? So we all agree there's net current. I didn't hear quite the amount of, oh my god, that I expected, but hopefully we all agree. Now the current will flow. Uh, and the current must be due to an EMF. So say, well, the EMF must work. That's the only way it could possibly be to work. And then we can also look at our Faraday's law, which I've erased or covered. Oh, yeah, here we go. So now, are we doing Faraday's law now? Do we have a flux? Yes. The field is going through the loop. Do we have a changing flux? Yes. As it exits the loop, we have a changing flux. Therefore, do we have an EMF? Yes. So without even knowing Faraday's law ahead of time, our simple predictions just based on the QB cross V force would basically give you, uh, would tell you that this is gonna happen. Okay. What is FP on the positive charge? It's probably a B. Positive, that's a B. Oh, I'm sorry, this is, that's a negative charge, that's the line of the wire. Okay, so positive charges move up, negative charges get pushed down. That's the edge of the wire. Can only draw so big. I don't understand why the lack of force on one side makes a current flow. Um, okay, how about this? There are no mobile positive charge carriers. You're real. You like to live in the real world. Okay? There's no mobile positive charge. Forget about that. There's only free electrons. And I'm pushing free electrons here that way. They're going to go around. Right? They're going to get out of here. Let's pretend they're going to have some momentum. Oh, we're going to keep going. Right? Over here, I had negative electrons being pushed both ways. So they just sort of, the, the current they create cancels. So that's why the current's there. But here, if I push my charges only on one side of the loop, they're going to go around the loop. Think of it that way. No. Okay, so what we're going to do now is apply Faraday's law to that. Okay, just kind of like the last big bullet. Uh, okay, so. Since a hand is on. Yes. I was told a hand was on. Okay. Okay. Um, the other question is. Uh, oh, hey. Can I step into it for like so one loop would be the exit of the magnetic field, so the current stops. Yeah, once it's all the way out, the current stops. Yeah. So it's only well. So the other question here, maybe the same person, was uh, the current only exists when it's halfway in a field. No. The current exists when it's exiting the field. If it's sitting air not moving, now there's no forces on any of the free charge carriers. Right? It has to be halfway in, halfway out, and moving. Because that's also what it takes to have D phi BDT. So we calculate it with D phi BDT. We'll make you'll see the connection even better. Here we go. So all we're going to do is apply Faraday's law um, to the square root. See, what do we get? How big of a current we're going to get? How big of an EMF we're going to get? Watch. Okay. 
watch for hands. This is why I do this. I can't even see the hands when people are yelling at me. I still can't see them. It's like camouflage, these old chairs and white all wear. You're welcome. Uh, okay. okay, so fairness all, what's ready? What's the definition of, definition of EMF? EMF is an old timey word for electromotive force. Back when they didn't really understand how circuits work, they thought there was a force moving the electrons around in a mechanical way, a little hand going like that. That's what EMF literally means. It's not a good technical word for reasons that get into non-conservative fields that we don't want to talk about. So just think of it as, like your book says, EMF is the work that the chemical battery does to push the charges around the circuit. Here, it's the work that Faraday's law does to push the charges around the circuit. It's a voltage, and the units are volts. We'll get into the weirdness of it maybe a little bit, but for now let's do this. The EMF minus NB by B dt. So now we're going to do the vector calculus of it. Margin. Oh, good one. Yeah, probably. I'll, I'll let you have that. We've got to get through this. Here we go. Okay, so the loops, let's say the loop had area length L on either side. So it's a square loop. Fuck, I promise you. Square loop. Okay, and uh, here we go. So let's calculate it. Um, equals, like I said, n will always be 1, so let's just call that 1, fine. And say minus d dt, we've got to do a time derivative, let's calculate space course. B A. Okay. B dot A, but B and A are in the same direction, aren't they? Because <coughs> B is into the board, and if you have a little area, which way is the area vector? Perpendicular to the surface of the area. All right, so like we talked about, I think, last time a little bit, if the area of this thing would be like that, if we define this way as positive, or it'd be out if we define this way as positive. Let's define clockwise as positive. It'll be okay. <coughs> Okay, therefore then the dot product b dot a is really just b times a in magnitudes. And we'll say it's going to be a positive value. Alright, so b a or if you like, b a times the cosine of zero. Because I just made it in the same direction. Which is one. Okay, so now here's the tricky part. Which one of those is going to change? You've got to think about what does this really mean? Is b changing or is a changing? So b means the magnitude of that field. So this is constant. This means the area with field in it. Right? So that's not just the area of the loop. That's the area that contains field. Right? That's the A. If I want to calculate this plus, I would say it's the B times this A right here, not that. Right? Okay, just blow on the left side. Okay? So now, how are we going to do that mathematically? Do it. I know we can do it. Minus d dt. I'll do the b and you do the rest. B. Okay, I'll do the whole thing. What is the area in here that's sort of slowly going away? Well, it's this times that, right? It's a rectangle. Length times width. The length is going to be a. The length is l the whole time. I'll do the l. You do the rest. B. L times, and it's the width that's changing. In time. Okay. As the thing is going through, the area is constant, 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 blah, 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 then suddenly it starts to drop from L to zero. And that's a single dimension. It's happening at the velocity V. So we write it first, and then you can think about it and decide if you believe it. It's L minus V out, minus V T. So B, and this is the changing A. D A D T is L times L minus V T. So I'm going to write this small. Uh, Drawing myself into a corner here. But if we were going to plot, just put this somewhere more reasonable on your notes. If we were going to plot versus time, where we have the area that we care about, it goes from L squared, right, when it was all in the field, down to zero when it's completely out of the field. Like that. It's a line going down. And if it starts happening, we could say at time equals zero. So if you set time equals zero to the right to the point where it starts to exit the field, then this is a plot of area versus time. And you can see it's a line that starts out at L and, uh, and goes down. Well, the area is at L squared, so the width is L, and it goes down. That's why it's L times L minus VT. Okay, so you believe it. Good. Thank you. So now let's take the derivative of that. 
And that's the derivative, the negative derivative, getting messy, of the negative derivative of b l squared, all constants. Right? Derivative of b l squared is zero. So this is two, this is a product, this is a sum of two terms here. So the first term, the derivative is zero. The second term is b l v. Because right? it's a derivative with respect to time, it's just time to the first power. So we'll drop that to the time to the zero power, which is one. Right? So the derivative of negative b l v t is negative BLV times negative one. So this whole thing is BLV. That's the EMF that you're going to get if that thing goes out. Okay. Let's see if that made any sense. The EMF is a square root of exudes stage right is BLV. That means the EMF is zero, 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 zero. BLV, well, it's going out. BLV and then zero. The flux here is zero. As it moves up, the flux is constant. Because the rate of change of the area is constant if it's moving at a constant velocity. So you just get some EMF for a while and the EMF stops. That's what happens. Let's see. What we're going to do now is ask ourselves, for the, after the, we'll take a break. Let's ask ourselves, does this match our simple little forces moving around thing? Oh, I bet you it will. Look, BLV. They're almost on top of each other. BLV, BLV. Why did it come out the same? Because basically, uh, here we polarized it by BLV. Right? Or, sorry, we, po we polarized it by BLV, but now that this one is shorted out, that same polarization is happening here. That delta V that was a polarizing voltage before, it's like it's being shorted. I'm sorry to use that word again. But it's being shorted by this wire with no EMF induced in it. So that same BLV is now the EMF around the loop, whereas here it was just polarized. So same thing. Same BLV we got when we did the cylinder, right? So we don't have to, you could just say this left line of the loop is getting a BLV uh, delta voltage, which becomes EMF once it's a current loop. Cool. Okay, so, so far, it would seem that Faraday was actually not as that smart. Like I said, right, didn't do any math, because all he did was come up with a tricky way of defining what we already knew from Q, V cross V. There's like nothing new here, it would appear, right, based on what I've showed you. So after the break, I'll show you that there's nothing new here. We wouldn't call it Faraday's law if it weren't. So time for this 10 3 Okay, let's take a break.
So before we move on to what I was planning next, we're just going to take a second here to answer some brilliant and quick questions. Uh, for the, uh, so I left this drawing here because I think it's related to this drawing. For the area, do you consider the area the loop takes up or is it just the air in the middle? Okay. So I think what you're asking is, is the area the total area or is it just, I think by the air in the middle maybe you mean this left half. What it is is the area in D, B, A, D, T is that it's a flux. So it's the area that actually has a magnetic field in it. So the area you care about is this area right here. Okay? How much is still, how much area of the entire loop is still in the field? So other good questions were, does it matter that it's halfway? No. Put it halfway, so it'd be easy to see. So if it's inside, so it's outside. Which leads to an interesting question. So is this EMF going to go down to decay as it goes through? Uh, actually, it's not. Let's think about that for a second. If this is going by V, what would the EMF be as a function of time? Our answer was a constant VLV. So that would imply that it must be constant. I mean, if you just want to go mathematically, you'd say V is constant, the magnitude of the field, the length of the thing is constant, and the V is constant. But if we wanted to think about it physically, we'd say, okay, yeah, so the answer is there's no EMF, and it goes up to VLV, and then it comes back down when it exits into it. The edge and exit the edge. Does that mean that every shape loop it'll be constant? No. That's why I did a square. Let's think about here's your edge and here's your loop, a diamond. Diamond, yes. What would happen if a diamond moved out? Would you get a constant amount? No, you would not. Because the area that moves out each second changes for that shape. Let's think about the area that moves out each second. Here's a second, and here's a second from the edge of the loop. Right? There's the area, the change in area. And here's the next second. There's the change in area. Here's the next second. There's the change in area. All those changes in area as it move out are the same. That's why the change in area is the same. The EMF is the same. And we've got a constant BLP. What do I do that here? Here's the first one moving out to the second one. So that's a nice change in area. What about this one? Oh, not just because I've moved it farther over. But you can see because this is a triangular shape getting wider, you get a bigger area. And then what about this one? The biggest area here. So here is where to plot the EMF versus time when it enters, it would go up. Because the EMF, uh, because the change in area is getting bigger and bigger. So the EMF is getting bigger and bigger. What about when you start going down here? It's getting smaller again down to zero. So that's what the EMF would do. Okay, I just made a lot of the fabric law. The shape of the EMF plot versus time is the same as the shape of the loop. The 
if you turn it 90 degrees. I think I can claim that law. You're gonna see why in a minute when you see Lenz's law. It's better than Lenz's law, okay? It's got more meaning in it than Lenz's law. So maybe I will be on that list after coming up with that. And then I had one more question, was another good question, and I forgot it was so good. At are we assuming the wire is very thin, so its diameter doesn't matter when considering the area? Yes, that wasn't a good question. That's also a good question. That's not the one I was thinking of. Yes, it's a thin wire. Mm -hmm. If we had a moving loop starting with a large area to a smaller area in a constant magnetic field, would that cause an EMF? Yes. We're going to see this is very general. It doesn't have to be things moving. That's what we're headed for here. And I thought I had another one that I liked. Oh yeah, what if we define the A vector to be the opposite to B, so cos 180 would make it negative. So if we set this up, we said A was into the board. I'll try to draw this on maps, I know I'm just talking now. A was into the board, A dot B. And we said if we went fully into it with all the directions, which we're going to do with the Lenz's law, we would have said that that means the current flows this way. Okay? Because we said A was positive into the board, we got a positive current, we have a positive EMF. As a resistance, the current would be the same way. So say, which way did the physical current go? That way, because A is this way, we define positive that way. If we had said, no, A is out of the board. A is out of the board. That means the positive direction would be this way. Okay? Our answer would have been negative BLB. So the current, we would have said, oh, it's the opposite of that direction. Oh, the current would be that way. Okay? So what? don't try to be able to do that on your own right yet. But what I want to tell you is, it doesn't matter which way you pick A won't affect the physical thing that happens. Just like in an XY, you know, in a Cartesian coordinate system, if you pick X positive to the left, the ball doesn't start to fly up in the air. Right? It's just mathematically how you're describing it. So the same thing here. If you pick A the other way, all your answers will be negative, but the physical phenomena will end up being the same. Okay, so it doesn't matter which way you pick A. We're going to see more of that in lenses along. Okay, so Faraday, so Great sense that ever lived. All these words he coined here. Oxidation number, anode, capital, wafer, ion, discovered benzene, induction, field concept, yada, yada, yada. But why is really the greatest was this experiment. Okay, so Faraday, I don't think I told you this story, got into consulting because he wanted to make some money. Who do you consult for when you want to make money? The military, right? So consulting for the Navy for 10 years, made a lot of money, became very depressed uh, doing that kind of stuff. So I want to get back to research. And what problems are you going to work on? He wants to work on this thing that they, were, they knew there was a deep connection between electricity and magnetism. Right? There had to be a connection because of what Ersten figured out, which was that um, if you had that current going, an electrical phenomenon, a full current, you had a compass over here, you turn the current, the compass moved. Right? We saw that happen. So clearly you could use electricity and current to make something happen to a magnetic field. But what would be really great is if you could use a magnet to make some electricity. To make some current flow. Because the only way you can make current flow at the time were batteries, which are big, messy things. Of course, they're wonderful now. You know, the lead acid battery in your car, invented in 1827. Unchanged. Okay. That's how far we've come with batteries. Look at my eyes a little better. But we still use the lead acid battery. Batteries were horrible, and then there's like rubbing caps with Teflon, which you, know, you can do that, but it's hard to make a whole technology based. So we needed another way to make electrical current using a magnet. It seemed like we were so connected, there must be a way to do it. So people had tried for a decade. Well, Faraday was out of the game. How are we going to do this? Faraday is gone, so maybe we'll figure it out. We create like Faraday. They said, okay, we'll take the magnet, and we have a current loop here hooked up to a voltmeter, and we'll stick it in here like that. Now we'll stick it in here like that. And say, no. Nothing. Okay, so let's see. We'll take it. And maybe if we balance it on top, it'll give us some magnetic... No. Okay. So what if we wave it like that? No, nothing. What if we bring it in this way? And look, and nothing. And nobody could discover. They weren't smart enough to figure it out. And Faraday said, let me approach this problem. And Faraday went, oh, yeah, it's got to move. That's all he did. He figured out it had to be moving. This is D phi BVT. It takes a change in magnetic flux in a loop to give you a response. Okay? That's really it. He also was able, you can see there's a lot of terms here. If you just make a single wire loop with some copper wire, a radio shack, and a magnet, you're not going to see it. You've got to have like thousands and thousands of loops and a very sensitive galvanometer to see it. You're not going to see it simply. So Faraday was also really good at making really sensitive instruments. But he was also smart enough to say, oh, maybe it's the change that causes it to happen, not just having a magnetic field there. 
Does that make you the greatest house ever lives? Eh, not really. Here's what he did. That is the basis of electric generators and motors. He also made the first motor. And he didn't patent them because he felt like all this should go to the benefit of mankind. So if he had patented the generator and the motor, it might have taken a little bit longer for the world to have generators and motors. He's like, no, just give it away for free up here. So think of how much money he could have made. But he didn't. Great sense there. OK. So now, that was his experiment. But let's look at it, because it's also telling us something sort of fundamental is, uh, now wait a minute, the wires didn't move, did they? You might say, oh, all Faraday did was take uh, the F equals QB cross B force and kind of cast it in a different way and try to claim it was a new law. But now suddenly this, this is a new law, or it is, it is his idea is more fundamental than just uh, basic QB cross B. Faraday's experiment, let me just draw it real quick, let's just draw what we just saw there, is that you have um, a wire loop like this, that, and the resistor just means you can measure the current, right? You know, you know from your labs you could measure the voltage across that resistor. And the wire is coming out like this, so this is out of the page in my 3D view here. Out of the page of the page. And we took that magnet, and let's think for a second of why did it cause a change in flux? You gotta know something about the geometry of these magnetic fields to be able to do problems on this. So remember the field around the bar magnet, it points out here, and it's really strong when you're really close to the magnet, and it points in there, and that's the B field. There's a big field inside you don't have any access to. It curves around and goes from one side to the other. We don't care about that. Right now we care about the field pointing out. And that's what we're about to stick into the loop. The field pointing out gets weaker as you get further away. Like that. Same thing over here. It points towards, but it gets weaker as you get farther away. <coughs> so you can see that if you move that way, you're changing the flux going through the loop. When you're far away, it's like it's just like if you blow and it just diffuses away. I can feel it here. I feel nothing here. So if you have your loop and you go like that. More wind is going to go through the loop the closer your blow around gets. Okay, so this causes a d phi d dt due to the uh, b change. Right? By the b change, I mean here. Now this is strong b, and this is weak b. So as you move the magnet closer, the stronger b. It also shows you why the flux uh, goes one way, sorry, the EMF goes one way when I approach. So let's try that again. I approach and it went, let's see, more, it'll be able to go faster. Okay, so I approach and it went, uh, and there, uh, it moved. I, I used that problem. Okay, here we go. I'm going to approach and it went positive. I'm going to pull away and it goes negative. Approach positive, away negative. So it does the opposite, because one is increasing the B field, and one is decreasing the B field. So the B field is pointing the same way from the magnet. So which way I move affects which way the flux is changing. If I approach, the flux is going up, if you define it A that way. If I pull away, the flux is going down if you define A that way. Okay? So, uh, Okay, so we induced the EMF with no moving uh, charge carriers. Right, so therefore, we know that it's actually in general true that Faraday's law holds. Okay, it's not that Faraday's law is a special case of the QBB effect. It's that actually the QBB stuff is more like a special case of Faraday's law. Because here we have it, and they're not moving. Right? They feel no force in terms of QBB, yet they still swirl around. They swirl around because they have to. This Faraday is long. Oh. Let's see. Okay, so now what we're going to do is talk about Lenz's Law. Lenz's Law. So you can imagine that we can give you problems to say, which way is the EMF? That's a very popular kind of problem. You'll see those. And it's a little bit hard to get 
do with Faraday's law, you've got to think about the vector calculus. Lenz's law is basically just a way to get there more quickly. Lenz's law is a really independent law. Faraday's law. Here's Lenz's law. Lenz's law is the negative sign of Faraday's law. I'm not sure who got it named first. I'll have to look that up. It's fair to be like, what? That's literally all it means. Okay? So let's think about this for a second. What does this mean? Positive, people were asking about positive and negative EMF. Positive EMF, which way a positive EMF is, is defined by positive A, like the direction that you make the area. So if I have a loop and uh, uh, well, let's just go a little down first. So a positive about EMF is defined by the direction of the area vector. And then an induced E opposes uh, the change in phi B. Okay? But what does that mean, induced E opposes the change? I wouldn't throw it Let's see, let's see a little bit different. Let's that out. I'm just going to go on the row here. I'm going off my notes. The induced EMF, EMF creates a B field induced. There's a new B field. Because right? when you have an EMF, you create a current. What does current, current create? A new field. It creates a B induced that opposes D phi B. I'll say, let's keep it in words. It opposes the change in phi B. Because this is the, the whole point of Lenz's law is it's a way to get the answer quickly without doing the math. So let's leave the math out of it. All right? So let's see. So here's an example. Here we go. So we're going to do just a small version here of the, the, of the square loop coming out of the field. Uh, let's make it halfway out here. Let's make it not halfway out. Don't worry. Let's make it partly out. There's your B field. The B is pointing in. The uh, wire is going to the right. The wire loop is moving to the right. Uh, which way is the current going to go? So the point is, we don't even have to define A, the direction of A. And we don't even have to come up with the direction of the EMF. The point of Lenz's law is you can actually answer these without doing that. Okay. I'm not sure why I wrote the top bullet. Now I think this is from some other lecture. This was about poetry or something. This is the only bullet you need. The induced EMF creates an induced B field that opposes the change in phi B. Right. So let's look at this and say the B field is in. Okay. As we pull the thing out, so it, as loop exits, the amount of B in decreases. See what I mean? So we're being very non-mathematical here. The amount of B in inside that loop is going down. B in is constant, but the loop is going away. So the amount of B in in this area is getting smaller. So what does Lenz's law say? The EMF increases B in. Okay. How are we going to increase B in? We're going to flow a current that, according to the right-hand rule, creates a magnetic field into the board. Here we go. The flow of the current is curvy and the field is straight. And we want more field into the board, therefore, without doing any math, we know that the current flows out here. And therefore, the EMF's direction around the loop is that way. And that matches what we had before. That's what that Ooh. What if our field region were finite like that? And we had a diamond-shaped loop going into the field, like this. Oh my god, it's entering the field, it's diamond-shaped. What do we do? We don't worry about it, it's just Lenz's law. If it's just a multiple choice where you're asked which way is the current going, you don't worry about it. You say, the field is in, the field is increasing, pointing in. Right? It's increasing because the area of field pointing in is getting bigger. Increasing. 
when this law says the EMF will act to oppose that decrease. <coughs> as the loop, uh, right? E created, creates a B field induced that opposes the change. So the change is that you're getting more field pointing in, therefore the EMF wants to make the field point out. It wants to add field that points out. Uh, we want the field to point out this way. All right, so the field right hand this way, and let's go this way. Opposite direction as it goes in and out. That's why when you're looking at the thing, I'm like in and out, it's getting the opposite direction. Some people say, some people don't like this, but you also don't like math, so it's one or the other. Right? You can do the directions of the A vector or the B vector or the chain of the dot product, but you can also do it this way, no math. You just got to be able to oppose the change. Let me let you do one. Here we go. Here's a good one. Said, I thought there wasn't any current unless the loop is partially in, partially out. Talking about the diamonds. This one is in and out. I drew another dotted line here. So this diamond was moving from outside to east. Let me see my dotted line. Somebody asked, does B induced increase or decrease when the loop moves out of the field? Well, that depends on which shape it is. So the B induced depends on the current. The current is proportional to the EMF. So like when we drew the EMF, one was a diamond and one was a square. How the V changes goes with how the EMF changes. So it depends on the shape of the loop, like the law of All right. I don't remember. Let's just go through this carefully together and see if we can remember <coughs> the answer. So we can do it with Lenz's law without doing any math, I think. What you've got to look at it and say is, is there going to be an EMF? The answer is yes. There's going to be an EMF. And the reason is, go back to Faraday's law, it depends on the rate of change of the flux of the B field. If this thing were falling in a uniform B field, you wouldn't have an EMF. If it were falling through the edge of a B field, you would have an EMF. But it is falling through a changing B field. Remember what the B field looks like here, right hand rule, uh, it's into the board above, and then it's out of the board uh, here. So big B field here, and it gets weaker as you go away. So suppose the B field is changing in the loop. Okay. So B goes as 1 over R, right? If this is R. So uh, phi B changes as the loop falls. Okay, I've had the same chunk all the time. This is the whole point. So there's going to be an EMF. Everybody agrees there's going to be an EMF. Right? The flux is definitely going to change. Calculating that flux will be really hard. We'd have to do an integral, and the beam will vary in the circle. If you make it a square loop, it's not that hard. You can do it. It's a natural logarithm, but you can do it. But right now, we're not trying to calculate it. We're just using uh, Lenz's law. Okay, so we have uh, the B field pointing out of the loop. And as it drops, the B field pointing out gets less. We have less B field pointing out. So Lenz's law says, make more B field pointing out. Like Cookie Monster. 
B field out is your thumb out. Oh, let's go this way. No math. Just must go that way. So hopefully you thought there was an EMF. Maybe you got it that direction. Um, so that was the lenses law way. Do it mathematically or we can get these other useful examples here. Let's do it mathematically real quick. So let's make sure the math matches the lenses law. So to do it mathematically, the lens, you just say that. Right? Let's do it with math. Faraday's law with math here. Is that the EMF is minus 1 d dt of b dot a. So let's go ahead and if we're going to do it mathematically. We've got to define a direction positive. So which way do you want it? How many votes did we make the A vector point out? Good, that's what my notes do. Let's do that. Okay. So let's make the A vector point out. There's already one right there. Okay. When you make the A vector point out, you've already defined the positive direction going around. Right, so we've got the right hand rule, your thumbs on the area vector, your fingers are along which are calling the positive direction. So we have counterclockwise positive, which is convenient because that's actually the proper map. Let's see, so here uh, we have that A, okay, uh, so mathematically, so A is out, so A is parallel to B. All right. Okay, so A is parallel to B, so it must be, uh, oh, it's going to work, let's see, minus uh, DDT of just BA. So the magnitudes d dt of b a. So a doesn't change; it's b that changes now. So it's negative here. There's a negative there. The d b d t is negative. Right? Because why? Because here it's a big field, and in time it's getting smaller. Right? D b d t is going down. The field field is going down. Two negatives make a positive. So this is negative, and this is negative, so the EMF is positive. Well, I'm not negative is negative, the EMF is positive. And if the EMF is positive, that means the current goes the positive direction. If we had made A into the board, then this would have had a negative sign, but then the DBDT, uh, the little negative sign here, we put a negative there, but the B would have gone up. If you get that it's negative, but we would have had positive that way, it would have worked out. So you can do that. What is this law? If you like coming up with all A vectors, you can do A vectors. It's also allowed. All right. Okay, the last one we'll do is this. Probably some of you uh, really are into relativity. You can see it in your eyes. We love relativity. And you're saying, I still think that Faraday is full of crap. And I would say that, for example, in this case, you said the charge carriers aren't moving. So Faraday's law is more fundamental. Okay? But what if it's a relative thing? Maybe if I'm in the uh, reference frame of the magnet that the charge carriers were moving, right? the wire moved towards the magnet and moved away, charge carriers, QVB force, maybe that explains the whole thing. Maybe. I'm not really going to go through So let me show you one uh, that's closer to what he actually did uh, that shows there's absolutely no motion at all. Faraday's induction with no motion. Okay. So here is a little circuit with a wire loop on it, resistor, and switch. What do you love? Switch is very easy. Oh, no, it's just a Okay. Call the switch, current's going to fall. And beneath it, we put um, another wire loop circuit. This one just has a resistor where we can measure the EMF induced, or we can measure the, the current or something like that. Okay. Let's see. Quick questions are, how do you know A is out? I picked A to be out. It could be either way. Uh, can you move the top right or up? Shows you do it mathematically, you can pick the direction of the air. Up to you. Okay. Let's say what's going to happen here. We 
calls a switch. The current, and we'll call this circuit oh god, let's call it circuit one and two. The current in one is going to go boom, and it's going to go up like this. That's going to happen. Right? Calls a switch, obviously, this is the point where we call the switch. What about the magnetic field created? B of one at two. Right? Well, we got to think about it. This is the positive plate. The positive plates are always the bigger plates. So current is going to flow like that. Okay? And this is the part that's out of the here. It's sticking out at me like this. And here, uh, this is the part that's out of the Like that, facing each other. Current flows like that, uh, more down. So B1 is making a magnetic field like that. Making magnetic field or ground rule points down. And at two, this is saying what's the value of the center of this loop? So B1 at two, also, boom, like that. When you close the switch, suddenly you get a current, suddenly you create a B field at two. So let's look then at I2. And let's uh, follow Faraday's law and see if anything happens. I2. Uh, oh, I didn't want to get in directions. Well, this is clearly positive direction, and this is clearly uh, not clearly. We're going to define these as positive directions. Both of them are like clockwise looking down. They're both positive. So, say what's going to happen? What's going to happen is you're going to get a current blip right while this change happens. Okay? So, right here, you get a D phi B DT. Therefore, you get an EMF. Let's think of which way it would be. Uh, let's see, this, we can use Linda's law. This is make a current, making a B field in, and it's increasing, right, it went up. So Linda's law says this wants a current that's gonna oppose that. So it wants to make a B field the other way. So the B field increase down, this wants to make a B field up. Right, what makes a B field up? Uh, this way, against that direction, so it's negative. So what this will do, this is the important time here. There'll be no current, no current, and right when we flip, it'll go whoo, like that. There we go. Induce negative current. To oppose the change in B12. That means change. All chemistry on the other side. And it's, why is it only for a second? Because the change only happens for a second. Because this flip happened really fast. Nothing moved. Okay? Nothing is moving here. Top circuit's not moving, bottom circuit's not moving. There's absolutely no reason to calculate a QBB force. It's just there because uh, Faraday's law is very general. Okay, see you next time.